Hi. Let's talk about the Flintstones. <laughs> Musical styles are still a very important form of communication for our young people. Before we even start, I'm reminding you now that this is one of the most strange and bizarre movies I've talked about so far in the channel, so just making sure you know that. Okay, here we go. The 1994 Flintstones film is the live adaptation of the popular cartoon of the same name that ran from 1960 to 1966. It was directed by Brian Levant, who prior to this produced Mork and Mindy, and went on to direct Jingle All the Way, if you can believe that career trajectory. And it was written by the team of Tom Parker and Jim Jernwine, the same team who wrote Richie Rich that came out the same year that this did. The main cast is a who's who of Hollywood. John Goodman, who we previously spoke about in our Borrowers episode, Rick Moranis from Saturday Night Live, Streets of Fire, Ghostbusters, and Little Shop of Horrors, Elizabeth Perkins, who'd go on to have roles in 28 Days, Weeds, and Sharp Objects. Actress and comedian Rosie O'Donnell from A League of Their Own, Harriet the Spy, Tarzan, as well as her self-titled show that ran from 1996 to 2002. Kyle MacLachlan from Twin Peaks, Sex and the City, as well as having a pretty humorous recurring role in How I Met Your Mother. Holly Berry from the X-Men franchise, Kingsman, and John Wick Chapter 3. They even had veteran actress Elizabeth Taylor, who's been in the game since literally World War II. What? I know, right? It's insane. Now, even getting into the surface level stuff with this movie could have me ranting all day long. The fact that this society has lawn mowers, basketball hoops, bus routes, adoption agencies, bowling alleys, and goddamn radio stations, yet still call themselves the Primitive Stone Age, just boggles the mind to no end. The production team put their all into making the world not only feel real and practical, but also making sure they stuck as closely to the original show as possible, down to Fred jumping up in the air when he says his catchphrase, as well as all the animals in the world making humorous one-liners. You can't help but take a moment to appreciate how many practical sets and items they used, especially with the animals. They're as animatronic as often as possible, and when they do use CGI with the Flintstones pets, they're about as good as you can ask for, especially considering the time that this film came out. But by far, my favorite small thing is that the B-52s, one of my favorite bands of all time, makes an amazing cameo as the BC-52s, and even did a cover of one of the Flintstones' original songs for the film, and I really can't tell you how happy that makes me. Now, when I decided on this film as today's topic, I initially had a mind to really just talk about the friendship between Barney and Fred, as well as Wilma and Betty, but as I rewatched and looked closer, I did realize that the friendship topic isn't nearly as important as the other two major themes that get brought up and explored. So let's take a second and dissect it, shall we? <laughs> The main thing that the film focuses on, though it chooses to do so by using Fred's new job as a plot point, is Betty and Barney's deciding to adopt a child. Now, it's never said why they chose to adopt rather than trying to have a kid, and I actually really appreciate that that's not touched on. Maybe one of the pair can't have kids, maybe they think adopting will be cheaper, maybe they lost the child and they're attempting to try again, so to speak, but regardless, I do think it's good to make audience think about things like that. The movie starts with Fred having already made the decision to give Barney the money he needs, and once Wilma finds out what Fred did, she's simply overjoyed. The two are nothing but kind and loving to the Rebels, and it's pretty heartwarming. They don't ask the Rebels if they think it's a good idea, and they only attempt to ease their mind about not being able to pay them back right away. And from the jump, Betty and Barney have nothing but love and affection for Bam Bam, despite how hard he can be to handle at times. And when it comes down to saving the kids at the end of the film, it's Barney who shows no fear or hesitation to launch himself from a goddamn catapult to reach and save them. Side note, it's hilarious that because Barney weighs less than the boulders that the catapult is shooting to the conveyor line, he goes way farther and ends up hitting the wall instead. Anytime we get a scene with Betty, she's either showing appreciation to Wilma for helping her in the situation, or just talking about how much she loves Bam Bam. And sure, we don't get a lot of time to really dive into the topic as the film is only 90 minutes long, but they did a wonderful job in giving us enough information and solid acting to really care about them as a family. And I have to give them credit for making that kind of topic so front and center to the audience, especially in what's otherwise largely a comedy. 
There's another aspect to the film that, while I don't personally think is as large as the previous point, I still do love it and I still do think it's worth discussing. <laughs> In the film, we get two characters who have to come to terms with and own up to their own poor decisions. Obviously, Fred is the bigger of the two in that he immediately lets his new power and wealth go to his head, and he ends up treating Barney and most everyone else like total shit. Obviously, by the end, he realized his mistakes, apologized to those he hurt, and turned down the promotion that the head of the company was trying to give him, recognizing that power and wealth turn him into somebody that he doesn't like. But in my opinion, the far more interesting of the two examples is of Halle Berry's Miss Stone. She starts off completely on board with Cliff's embezzlement plan, and does her best to seduce Fred and make him more susceptible to their plan. But as the story goes along, she quickly realizes that Fred is a good person, that he loves his wife and family, and that doing this to him will absolutely ruin him. She even tries to call off the plan, telling Cliff, I'm worried, Cliff. He's smarter than we thought. <laughs> He'd have to be to get himself dressed in the morning. He's been asking a lot of questions. I think we should just call the whole thing off. When Cliff finally tells Fred he's being framed, Miss Stone looks genuinely regretful for her part to play in it. And it's Miss Stone that stops Cliff from shooting Fred and the Dictabird. Flintstone, kiss your bird goodbye. <laughs> No, Mr. Stone, take the rest of the day off. And yes, I know that they were only shooting small rocks and it wouldn't have killed anybody, but it's still the thought that counts, okay? And arguably the most impressive thing she does, far more so than just hitting Cliff, was her choice to stay there and wait for the police so she could turn herself in. She realized what she'd been a part of and didn't want to run from the consequences of her actions. It's a super solid moment that I don't think gets as much recognition with casual viewers of the film. All in all, I have to say I really do think that this is one of the more perfect adaptations in that everything from looks to characters to the heartwarming and funny moments that the original series has, this movie brought in spades. And regardless of the final box office results and regardless of the jokes often made about this film, I really think that the amount of passion and dedication that goes into things like this simply can't be understated at the end of the day. And as you may know by now, I love leaving things off on small miscellaneous notes, so here are your notes for today. Fun fact, this film won six awards. Not so fun fact, two of those six were Golden Raspberry Awards, one of which being for Worst Screenplay, which both makes sense to a degree and makes things even crazier when you realize that it took 35 people in total to write and finish this script. But I'm curious, what do you think? styles are still a very important form of communication for our young people. Hi.